The following audio is from Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Father, we thank you for what we've heard this morning. Thank you for the music that's been sung, the verses that have been read. Lord, for the service we've had already, folks who have come. But Lord, this is a new hour, and we need you. And so, Lord, I pray for a new anointing of your grace and strength. I pray for clarity of thought, for wisdom. I pray that your spirit would work freely in our midst. Lord, I fully understand that without your spirit, nothing will last, nothing will be accomplished of eternity. And so, Lord, I pray that now you would strengthen, fill, use. I pray our hearts would be open, our minds would be attentive, and I pray that you would take your word and apply it to the hearts and lives of your people as only you can. And Lord, we give you the praise. We thank you that there's a Savior who has come. In our brokenness, in our sadness, in our despair, in our confusion, who has come to us to rescue us. And we thank you for that. And we thank you for that glorious truth. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, please take them and look at Habakkuk, actually, chapter 3. And uh, just so that you know, uh, this service is a little unusual because at the end of each year, we take a few moments to read the names of loved ones that we have lost. It usually falls closer to the new year, and this might be the first time it's, since we've started this that it falls a little closer to Christmas. But it's an important time for us. And so this morning we will read the list that I have before me. I know we could probably add others as well, but these are folks from our church family or loved ones of people in our church family. So in memory this morning, we stop to reflect and think about Betty Card, Cassandra Hallett, Charlie Craig, Donna Kahl, Garrett Van Dellen, Herb Heistick, Yvonne Diaz, Janet Savoy, Jim Rutherford, John Thiessen, Karen Hallett, Rick Maynard, and Walton Hahn. The reading of those names, for me, is always sobering. I was telling the folks this morning, by the end of the year, you forget that we had a spell. We had three funerals in about a month or less. We had a space of five funerals within a month and a half. There's been tremendous loss and grief in our congregation this year. And so we read, and it's sobering, and we reflect, and it's a reminder that we find ourselves today in a broken world, a fallen world, a world where there is sin, there is sadness, there is sorrow, and grief. The hymn written by Henry Light, I think, serves us well this morning. He wrote, Swift to its close ebbs out life's little day. Life's little day. Earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away. Change and decay in all around I see. O thou that changest not, abide with me. The message this morning is Christmas in Habakkuk. And the reason for that is because we have been in the book of Habakkuk and we come to a close of that book actually today. And, and I, I'm amazed, at least for myself, you might come to a different conclusion, but that it's so appropriate this morning as we look at the very last three verses of this book, how they line up to what we've just said and where we're at this morning. In the book of Habakkuk, he has, of course, an Old Testament prophet, he has surveyed the reality of his situation. He's looked around at his culture, and they're a mess. They have turned from God. Uh, they're sinful. They're wicked. There's violence. There's corruption. There's hatred. I, I mean, it's just abounding. And he says to God, where, where are you? Don't you see? Don't you know? Why will you allow your people and this culture, your, your chosen people, to continue to act like this? And God reminds him that I do know, I do see, and I will act, 
And the way that I will act is, I will bring the Babylonians down, and they will deal with my people. They will be the rod of punishment for them. And when Habakkuk hears this, he's mortified because he knows of the cruelty of the Babylonians. He has seen what they have done. They are known for their violence. And he says, God, wait a minute. How is it that you will take a people more wicked than your own and judge them? And God says, my word is true. The vision is sure. Wait for it. And Habakkuk comes to a point where he understands that now he must wait for it. To wait for it. Here's what he writes at the end of the chapter. Verse 17. Though the fig tree may not blossom, and, and for us, maybe, for many of us, not in the agrarian culture, this might not mean anything, but as you're talking about a farm community, a shepherding community, uh, listen to what happens. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, Though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food. We're not talking about Sobeys or another grocery store, superstore that you can just go to. When the food in the field fails, it fails. Though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. What he just describes here is not hyperbole. He's not just trying to paint a picture of, ah, it seems really bad, and so we'll, we'll make it as bad as we can. No, what he is saying is a reality. The Babylonians are coming. They will lay siege to your city. People will starve and die and be killed. The walls of the city will be destroyed. Your holy place, the temple, will be ravished. It will be demolished. There will be nothing left. And for those who do survive, you are going into captivity. This is his reality. This is what he knows is happening and will happen. It is the loss of everything. Everything. And, and you can just hear in this description the darkness of the situation. These are dark words, and these are dark days. And, and I find it ironic this morning that for us, in our time of the year, you know this is the darkest time of our year, right now. The 21st was the darkest day of the year, with the least amount of sunlight. Darkness, it's, it's oppressive, it, you feel it, you, it weighs on you. Now I know for some of you this morning, God bless you, this is the most wonderful time of the year right? How many of you like that this morning? This is, this Christmas is your time to shine. Can I see your hands? Okay, one. That's awesome. <laughs> awesome. God bless you, Susan. Um, and, but for some of you, it's like, this is great. You had your gifts bought by July. The ugly sweaters have been out way too long. The trees have been decorated. We have a lady in our church, God bless her, she has trees in her house all year long, and every year she adds another tree. I'm fearful we may lose her someday in the forest. <laughs> she is a real lady. It's, it, I won't tell uh, never mind. Um, for others, you love the Christmas lights, and you decorate, and for some of you, you keep them on your house the whole year long, and that's because you're lazy. <laughs> And so for some of you, it is. It's the most wonderful time of the year. But I think we all have to admit this morning, and what we just read, and when we think about the life that we've been living, uh, there are dark days in this world that we live in. Dark days. And we've experienced them. For some in this room, you've experienced financial difficulty this year. For others, physical difficulty, emotional difficulty difficulty, relational difficulty, spiritual difficulty, a dryness, and a difficulty in your Christian walk in your dark days. And I think this morning, it's not an exaggeration, that in some sense, whether you're in it now, and some of you are in it now, 
or you're just sort of coming out of it and you're starting to see a little glimmer of hope. But it's like storms in our life. You're either, you're either in them, you're coming out of them, or you're entering into them. And so this morning, my prayer is that as we see Habakkuk and his situation, the dark days of his life, that we can have a sense of what he is saying, we can have a sense of what he's feeling, and hopefully as we go through his journey this morning and bring this book to a close, we can have a sense of the hope and the praise, actually, at the end of this book. So verse 17, he reads, and it's gloom, and it's doom, and it's darkness, and it's, it's real. Verse 18, yet, yes, it's dark, yes, it's difficult, yes, it's painful, yes, there's loss, yes, there is the great fear of the unknown, and yes, there is the great fear of the known. And he says, this is the reality, and yet, nevertheless, in spite of that, yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. Yet, I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like hinds or deer's feet, and he will make me walk on the high hills. Now stop and think about this. The reality of what he just said. Not hyperbole. What he's dealing with. And he says, and yet I will rejoice. I will joy. The Lord is my salvation. Where does this come from? How does he manage to even speak these words in the midst of his darkness? And we have seen in the brokenness of Habakkuk's world, he has determined two things from our study. Number one, he has determined to wait. To wait. And this is not a waste of time in waiting in line for something. This is a hope and an expectancy. It is a, it is a, a a hope in the fact that God has worked in the past. He has been faithful in the past. He has redeemed Israel in the past. And he looks forward with hope and anticipation to what God will do in the future. His promises are true. And they're good. And it gives us this hope and expectancy that we can wait. It is not inactivity. It is, it is activity. It is working. It is growing. It is leaning into Him. It is worship. It is allowing Him to peel back the layers of our life to expose what our real issues are this morning. And so Habakkuk has been waiting in hope and expectancy. And then he says, the just will live by faith. By faith. And it's a reminder to us that if we have been declared just or righteous, we don't do that ourselves. It's a declaration by God that He is the only one that can declare a human being righteous because we've all sinned against Him. But those who are right or righteous, we must understand every day we have a responsibility then To live by faith, which means I trust Him and I live that life out. I know what God wants me to do today, and therefore I live day by day in faith. In faith. So while he's standing in the midst of the confusion swirling around him, he has the grace to say, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. It's grace. It's wonderful grace. It's amazing grace. And we have to be careful. Oftentimes when we talk about grace, we say, well, God is gracious and he is good. And sometimes we equate that grace with the idea that this grace now protects me from any bad, any wrong, any worry, any stress, any problems. The trouble with that is this. That's flawed. That's false. And that's not realistic. That's, grace is amazing. But it's much more than that. And certainly God gives good gifts, but I want to tell you something, brother and sister, there are gifts that he gives that certainly outweigh all of those things. And what Habakkuk shows us is a grace that even in the midst of the darkness, it is a grace that sustains and a grace that is powerful. I found this little poem by John Piper. Uh, He wrote talking about this kind of grace, right? And here's what he says. 
Not grace to bar what is not bliss, nor flight from all distress. And so he's tackling the idea that grace just makes everything happy and wonderful and smiley and joyful. He says, no, that's not the grace I'm talking about when I'm writing. Not the grace that says, be happy at all costs or it'll take all your sadness away. Not the grace to bar what is not bliss, nor flight from all distress. But this, the grace that orders our trouble and pain... Because God is in control. He does know. He is ruling. He is reigning now. The grace that orders our trouble and pain, and then, in the darkness, is there to sustain. That's grace. That's what Piper is talking about, and that's what Habakkuk has found. A grace then the midst of the darkness, the pain, the confusion, the sorrow, the hurting, the loss, it sustains us. And my brother and sister this morning, I don't know what you're going through, for many of you. I don't know what season you're in. But I promise you this morning, there will be a day when you will need sustaining grace. Sustaining grace. You say, Pastor Rick, that's great, but this is a Christmas service. I feel like you did a bait and switch on us, right? False advertisement. I want all my money back. You can have all your money back. We don't charge for be here, okay? Um, what does this have to do with Christmas? And I would say to you this morning, what Habakkuk has talked about, what he's experienced, has everything in the world to do with Christmas this morning and Boxing Day for us today because we live in a world which is broken, And it might not be the same as his world and what he experienced and the tragedy that he would face. But our world is broken and we sense it. Everything is breaking down. Our cars break down. Our appliances break down. We were caroling on Thursday and had a glorious time. Um, We had a bunch of non-singers there and it was still glorious. And at the last stop that we made as we were leaving... A woman came out and said, ah, oh, I just got home, and I think it was her, my washing, or not washing, my, my dishwasher broke down, and this was such a joy to me um, to, to hear this. And it was just, again, an affirmation of everything breaks down. Our relationships break down. Some of you folks, you have family events, and you ain't excited about it, right? Relationships break down. Bodies break down. 50? <laughs> We live in a broken world. We experience real loss, real pain, real hurts, and real suffering. And this is the reality, not just of Habakkuk's world, but of our world today. And this is the reality that the Bible doesn't shy away from. It presents it clearly, and it tells us then and identifies the source of all the brokenness. Because there is a source. In the beginning, God created a beautiful, perfect environment and created humanity, a man and a woman, to love him completely. No veil between. Could you imagine walking with the God of the universe in the cool of the day, in openness, no fear, no running, nothing to hide, no shame, This was their life. They had everything. Everything. Except one thing. Don't eat of the one tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But they decided to create their own reality. That they could be whatever they wanted to be. That they could decide what would be right and what would be wrong. They would be gods themselves. And so they disobeyed. They rebelled. And they plunged this world into chaos. I have a friend who just sent me a meme last week, and it was the look that I'm going to give when I see Adam and Eve in heaven. And the guy was like, Arr. I'm going to blame our original parents, but can I say something to you this morning? We are culpable for the world in which we live today, and we have been complicit as well. It is our selfishness. It is our greed. It is our lust. It is our anger. It is our impatience. It is our ugliness and our unkindness and all of those things that have contributed to the world in which we live today. 
There is darkness in this world and in our world, and part of it's because of us. Because of us. It's the reality of this world. And so our first parents rebelled. And God, in sadness, forced them out of paradise. And this has been really the hope of mankind since then, to find paradise, to go back. We all know something's missing. But in the mess of all of that, the God of heaven spoke of a rescue plan. A rescue plan. One of, the, one of the best books that we ever purchased was the Jesus Storybook. And, and I'm talking about the best book for adults, to be honest with you. We would read that book to our kids, and we'd be in tears. It was so um, life-giving and devotional. It's a, it's a little storybook written by Sally Lloyd-Jones, and it's called, the, the subtitle is, it's a Jesus Storybook. The subtitle is, Every Story Whispers His Name. And she starts in, in Genesis all the way through Revelation, and it just shows how a hero is coming. The, the, the rescuer is coming. And so she talks about the first part of Genesis and the fall and God's heart being broken and forcing Adam and Eve out of the garden. And then she says this, in any other story, that would be the end of the story. But not this one. And here's what she says on the next page. God loved his children too much to let the story end there. Even though he knew he would suffer, God had a plan, a magnificent dream. One day, he would get his children back. One day, he would make the world their perfect home again. And one day, he would wipe away every tear from their eyes. You see, no matter what, in spite of everything, God would love his children with a never-stopping, never-giving-up, unbreaking, always and forever love. And though they would forget him, and run from him. Deep in their hearts, God's children would miss him always and long for him. Lost children yearning for their home. Before they left the garden, God whispered a promise and said, it will not always be so. I will come to rescue you. And when I do, I'm going to do battle against the snake I'll get rid of the sin and the dark and the sadness you let in here. I'm coming back for you. And this is the God of heaven. He did not run away from our sin. He did not run away from our sadness. He did not run away from the despair that we caused. But instead, this God ran towards it, and he still runs towards it today. He runs towards it. And the amazing thing is this. God's rescue plan, the thing that he devised, his method would be that he himself would enter this broken and fallen world. Sometimes writers and screenplay, writers and, and I guess movies, will, will do a cameo appearance where the writer, or they'll have a, a famous person, they'll just slip them into the, the story somewhere. It's like, oh my goodness, that was so-and-so. Do you know something? The God of heaven, this is his story. And he has made a cameo appearance. Emmanuel. God with us. That the God who spoke all of this into existence, the holy, perfect, just, righteous, loving, the fountain of all goodness and joy, when humanity thumbed its nose at him and continues to thumb his nose and rebel against him, this is a God who devised a plan that he himself would come and take on flesh and dwell among us. My friend, I don't even think we stop enough to understand how staggering this is that the God, the, the finite God, would clothe himself in flesh. Listen to what Augustine says about this, the incarnation. He says, man's maker was made man. That he, ruler of the stars, might nurse at his mother's breast. To be a baby, a helpless baby, that the bread might hunger, that the fountain thirst, the light sleep, that the way be tired on its journey, that the truth might be accused of false witness, that the teacher be beaten with whips, 
the foundation be suspended on wood, that strength might grow weak, that the healer might be wounded, and that life might die. This is our God. He has entered into our environment. He has entered into our experiences. He is not somewhere out there. He came to live among us. Theologian Donald McLeod says this, he lived among a mother and a stepfather. He lived among brothers and sisters, among disciples and Pharisees, among Roman soldiers, lepers, and prostitutes. He experienced pain, poverty, temptation. He physically witnessed squalor and brutality. He heard obscenities and the helpless cry of the oppressed. He was not detached at all. He is God with us, fellow man of all men, crowded, busy, harassed, stressed, and even anxious. The Garden of Gethsemane, as great sweat drops of blood like sweat came from his brow, thinking about what was before him. No large estate, no financial capital. Didn't have money to pay his taxes or even to buy bread. He knew poverty. He knew need. He knew wants. No personal staff to protect him from interruptions. There wasn't an entourage protecting him. No power, influence protected him from injustice. He saved us from alongside us. And may I submit to you this morning that for all of those here who are fearful of life, fearful of life, and fearful of death, this is the one you've been waiting for. This is him. He's arrived. He has come. He's come to rescue us. And so in our fear and anxiety and our trouble, he has come. And this morning, his grace will save your soul from death. We cannot talk about Christmas without talking about Easter. It's impossible. Impossible. God incarnate in the flesh. Baby Jesus born on Christmas The man, Christ Jesus, died on a cross. And we look at his selfless life. No one ever lived like Jesus. No one. Selfless. Do you understand that Jesus never acted to do something for his own self? Ever. He is fasting for 40 days and tempted to turn a stone into bread, which would have been easy as the creator, and he chooses not to. And yet, when there's a crowd of 5,000 who miss their lunch and dinner, he provides a meal for every one of them. Never about himself. He must needs go through Samaria. As a Jew, why? It wasn't for a drink at Jacob's well. It was to meet a woman who relationship after relationship was broken over and over again, looking for happiness and joy and meaning from some man. And he goes there, tired, weary, worn. He sits and asks for a drink. But it was never about the drink. It was never about him. It was about her. And winning her to himself and finding what she had truly been looking for. Selfless life, sacrificial death. No one, no one took his life. Not the Pharisees, not the Sadducees, not the Sanhedrin, not the Romans, no one. Jesus Christ sacrificially laid down his life. No man could take it from him. He willingly laid it down and he said, I will easily take it up again. In his death, he stepped into our brokenness, our sin, our failure, our transgressions, the wrath that each and every one of us deserve from a holy, righteous God. God does love us. 
But God is holy, and his holiness is like the sun. You get burned by the sun, it's not the sun. Oh, sun, you're so angry, you're so bad. No, the sun is doing what the sun does. The holiness of God does what the holiness of God does. We, as sinful creatures, cannot enter into his presence. It would consume us. He is holy. And the penalty for our unholiness, of our rebellion, our sin, is death, eternal death. And what Christ did was he stepped into our place and the wrath of God that we deserved was poured on his head. And he endured all of it. He drank the cup of wrath dry for you and for me. Sacrificial death. And then his supernatural resurrection. He died. Everyone who watched the event, Roman soldiers knew about death. He was dead. He was dead. A a spear pierced his side. Out came water and blood. Put in a tomb, wrapped up, covered with spices. But three days later, something happened. The tomb was empty, and Jesus Christ arose, and today he is on the loose. He's alive and well, and he offers salvation to all who will repent and believe in him. He is the one who was promised. He is the one who said, in your mess, I will come. In your mess, I will be what you need. I will be the rescuer. And he has certainly done that and continues. His grace will save your soul from death. And this morning, if you're here and you don't know that, it worries me sometimes in church that folks grow up in churches, they're members of churches, they're baptized, they do communion, they do their catechisms, and somehow they think they're just in because we grew up that way. If you're trusting in anything other than Jesus Christ, it's a fool's errand. There's only salvation in him. Not in your church, not in my church, not in Baptist, Catholic, none of it. Not in good works. We must come to him. And today, today could be the day, if you understand your need of Christ, to call out to repent. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. I was going this way. Jesus is Lord He died for me. He lives. I'm going to turn and go this way. His grace will save your soul from death. And this morning, for those of us who know him, his grace will sit with you in your darkness. It's a blessing to have people who love you and care for you and gather around you and encourage you. And it can bring great comfort. But it's another thing to have the God-man sit with us in our darkness. It's a whole different ballgame. Max Lucado wrote this. He says, let him be as human as he intended to be. When we say things like, well, God knows, it's like, yeah, God knows. No, 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 no. Yes, he does know. But Jesus Christ knows as a man who lived in his flesh. Let him be as human as he intended to be. Let him him into the muck and the mire of your world, for only if we let him in can he pull us out. And I submit to you, my dear brother and sister, this morning, in the muck and the mire and the confusion and the loneliness and the sadness and the loss, it is time for us to allow the the God-man, Jesus Christ, into our mess. There are some kids, right, when it's time to clean up their toys, they run from it, right? And, and then usually the oldest ones have to stay there and clean up the toys. It's birth order, I think, right? We run from that. We run away from that. We run from the mess. Can I tell you something? Jesus Christ never runs from the mess of our life, ever. Well, you don't know. You don't understand. If you knew, it doesn't matter because Jesus Christ runs to our mess. He runs through the muck, and he runs through the mire, and he runs through the uncleanness. Listen to me. Do you understand why there are stories in the New Testament of Jesus Christ touching a leper? They're unclean. You can be defiled ceremonially, but you can be sick. Jesus Christ never hesitates. A leprous man comes to him and says, Lord, if thou wilt, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, I will. And he touched him. A man who would have not been touched. As a matter of fact, the religious crowd, 
if there was a leper coming, they would pick up rocks and throw them at that man so he would cross the street. But not my Jesus. He doesn't do that. And for too long, we've thought this idea that, oh, I've gone too far, Lord. I know I'm your child, but I'm dirty. I'm full of muck and mire. I'm unclean. If, if I were you, I would be done with me. I say that almost every week. God, if, if I were you, I would be done with me. And Jesus says, no. I am attracted to sinners who repent. My children, I'm there for you. So let him enter into the muck and mire of our lives. His grace there will sustain you. He will give you songs in the night that you've never heard before. He will guide and direct, and he will pull you out. This is powerful grace. And this is what Habakkuk found. And this is what we need this morning. Not grace to bar what is not bliss, nor flight from all distress, but this. The grace that orders our thoughts and pain, and then in the darkness is there to sustain. This is powerful grace. This is exactly what Habakkuk found in his situation. And this is what God's people can find as well. We move from perplexity, we're perplexed, we're confused, we're troubled. But if we allow this grace to enter to our lives, we'll move from perplexity, believe it or not, to praise. And when he sits with us in the darkness, it changes everything, everything. This morning we thank the Christ who came, God, Emmanuel, incarnate in the flesh, to walk among us. But we praise him. And knowing he did live among us, he died, he absorbed it all, and he lives today to make intercession for God's people. This is the joy of the season. We, above all people, even in our darkness, we have hope. And the hope is not found in who I am or what I've done or what you can do for me. The hope is in the person. His name is Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness this morning. Thank you for your word. And Lord, I, I pray that we would not soon leave this place without understanding the love that you have for humanity and the care that you have for your children. Lord, I know in this room, as I've surveyed the room, that there are many who are sitting in darkness, who are perplexed and confused and sad and lonely. And Lord, I pray that they would open their hearts to allow you to enter into the muck and mire, and that as you sit, that you sustain them, that you guide them. I know you will. You've done it in my life and in countless millions of lives. And so, Lord, I pray now that you would just have your way in our services and our hearts. May we glorify you through song as we prepare to leave. May we live a life of, of expectancy and hope. Leaning in your grace, we ask in your name. Amen. We conclude our service this morning singing a wonderful song, Behold Our God. So please stand with us and sing.